Good morning again, uh, Christ City. Glad, uh, glad that you're here. Um, last week, we started a new sermon series entitled Strengthening the Core, Essential Practices of the Church. Um, and in this series, what we've wanted to do is we want to explore what Christ City has identified as uh, three of our core practices, three anchoring actions that shape us as a church. Um, these core practices are worship, community, and mission. Oh, sorry, uh, Teen City, you guys are released. My bad. Yo. Hey, let's give them a hand, too. Goodness gracious. You'd think a parent of teenagers would have remembered to do that. <laughs> Good. Well done. Um, over the coming weeks, what we want to do is we want to look at each of these practices through a few different lenses. First um, being, how do we think about these practices? Um, and then how do we embody the practices? We mentioned last week that the way that we want to structure this sermon series uh, is kind of like how you might um, imagine or have experienced if you went to college, like a, a college class where you have a lecture and then you have a lab. Um, one week we'll focus on, uh, on one of the core practices and we will seek to lay a biblical and theological foundation for that practice. And then in the second week we'll have a panel um, discussion with a number of folks from Christ City on how they embody this practice in their own lives and in different areas of their lives. Last week, we spent some time uh, considering the biblical and theological aspects of worship, chiefly by looking at Acts 2 and building out our definition of worship, a definition which you can find on our website. That definition is, worship is a lived response, collectively and individually, to God's great love displayed in the work of Christ and our shared life in the Spirit. I want to repeat that. Worship is our lived response both collectively and individually, to God's great love displayed in Christ and our shared life in the Spirit. We talked about that worship is a response to God's love, and we went into detail on the different ways that worship takes shape, noting the collective form of worship that happens when the church gathers on Sundays, like we're doing here. But we also spent time considering the ways that we worship individually, recognizing that all of us worship God in a way that is meaningful and unique to each of us, and also understanding that our whole lives can be lived and can be viewed as worship. Our whole lives can be a response to God's love. This morning, we're going to hear from three panelists from Christ City uh, that I'm excited about uh, because, um, I, you know, I get to pick them. Uh, and so some of it is, uh, who do I want to hear from? And so I pick them and then kind of subject you to my own curiosities um, and praise God. Uh, this morning, we're going to hear from three panels from Christ City as they share about um, worship from their lives and from their perspective. So I want to invite the panelists to uh, come on up, if we can uh, welcome them. <clears throat> um, our, good luck. Sorry. Perfect. It's good. <laughs> well, I just want to make sure you're awake. Um, just by way of introduction, um, Jocelyn Henderson is uh, in the middle. Uh, she's, I, feel like, I don't know, you don't know who Jocelyn is. I don't know where you've been, but welcome to Christ City. Uh, she's our Director of Worship Arts here at Christ City. She's uh, a proud graduate of Spelman College in Atlanta. Uh, she's also graduated with two master's degrees, not one, but two from Baylor University, Master's of Divinity, and an MA in Church Music. She is an avid Aldi shopper. Uh, so if you to know Jocelyn is to know Aldi. Um, Drew Ackerman has been a member of Christ City for 10 years, and he has uh, played keys for Christ City, I think, for 11 of those 10 years. Um, he's also served as a small group leader. He works as an urban planner and a transportation specialist. Um, yeah, he's also Drea Ackerman's husband, if you didn't make that connection somehow. Um, and then lastly, Charles Williams. Uh, Charles has served in, a, uh, in various ministry roles for nearly a decade, including the last seven years as a uh, pastor at uh, National Community Church. Um, he currently serves as the citywide director for Young Life, uh, a ministry that's focused on the outreach and discipleship of teenagers uh, here in the district. Uh, Charles also regularly leads worship for us here at Christ City. He's a graduate of, of Howard University and also Har Harvard University. Yeah. What's up? Uh, and... Um, he wanted to make sure that I, that I knew that each and every one of you were aware of his deep, deep love for Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, uh, and he would welcome that at any time. 
uh, if you so want to give them that. So thank you, uh, friends, uh, for being here. Um, I just want to uh, just kind of start off uh, some of these questions you, you're aware of. Just want you to share some of your reflections on how you understand uh, the nature of worship, both when the church is gathered and then also when the church is scattered. So tell us a little bit about your just general understandings about worship when we gather, but also when we're not in this place. Um, whoever wants to go first, I want to hear from each of you. Jocelyn, <laughs> pass the mic to Charles. We'll let him go first. Yeah. Um, so, really quick, I, I grew up around corporate worship. I was the baby in the alto section getting passed around during rehearsals um, before I can even walk. Um, however, being around choirs, I, I've learned really quick that there is a beauty when you have just the purity of just multitude of voices singing mm. together. Um, and then also, you don't have to be right if it's a bunch of voices <laughs> singing together. <laughs> you just have to have the same intention of where you're trying to go. Um, mm. But even growing up hearing mass choirs and hearing that sound, like Miss City Mass Choir and um, all those great folks, like you, you learn that there's power when you just have multiple voices singing and just being together in the same direction. Same words, same notes, sort of, uh, <laughs> in harmony. <laughs> um, however, personally, um, from the music vein, I also grew up watching my mother, who would sing all the time, play gospel music all the time. Um, and just kind of be in this posture of just intention and intentional focus on the things of God. And I have also like followed in her trap. Um, I will find myself listening to folks like Common Hymnal and Anchor Hymns and like different artists, Portergate, that just allow me to bring in a headspace that brings me into the things of God. Um, but then I'm also learning that it's not just music as a way that we worship. And so, and so yeah, so figuring out what does that look like in my daily disciplines to engage with the things of God. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Sure. Um, share your reflections on how you understand the nature of worship when the church is gathered and also when the church is scattered. So um, being the director of worship arts here, I've got a very distinct role in shaping the worship. Um, so yeah, I understand worship as something that we do corporately, something that we do bodily, corporeally, something that we do uh, in a unified way. And it's also something you can do on your own. Um, and, it, and like Charles said, it doesn't always uh, involve music. Um, you know, Matt Redman wrote that, I'll bring you more than a song, because a song in itself is not what you desired. <laughs> you search much deeper within. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. So yeah, what, is, what does it mean to uh, <laughs> go to the heart of worship for this continual... I brought my phone up here, and I don't know why. No one else did. Um, <laughs> to go back to the heart of worship for uh, the things that we do here in this space from week to week. How do we live that out? How are we treating people? How are we um, interacting with folks? What do we do with our time? Um, and how we're, although we can't help it, how are we being perceived? Are we coming across as someone, as someone who loves God and loves neighbor, like that worship part is so integral in our lives, um, corporately and individually. Like if I were to see you in a grocery store, I would be like, hmm, that person's got a good moral compass or maybe not, you know, maybe not. Yeah, so I think having now had the chance to hear the question twice, I can now kind of refine my answer. Um, <laughs> so I'll do gathered first and then I'll do scattered. So I've, I've kind of always thought that the purpose of us gathering and worshiping together was to remind ourselves of God's presence and goodness. Um, there's just a power in, in numbers. Frankly, I think that hearing other people singing, um, talking to people about their, their weeks and how they've experienced God in that week um, is really powerful and something that I can't um, like summon myself um, 
just being, you know, going throughout my week, you know, day to day. Um, there's been times where I've come into Sunday worship and not even been in the band and been not in a great headspace and heard a song and heard other folks singing alongside me and been um, really moved by the, the power of that and just realizing that I needed that, that, um, that gathering of people together. Um, so I think that's the, the gathered part. The scattered part, I think, is it's more related to um, interactions, interactions with other, other human beings and just kind of realizing what it means to be human and um, committed to the flourishing of other, of other humans. I think that applies to, to parenting, to work, to kind of whatever um, work you find yourself in. I think for me as an urban planner, it's about recognizing the ways that um, the urban fabric can both um, degrade or uplift people. To It can contribute to an antisocial environment or it can contribute to people having access to opportunities um, and just wanting to be part of the solution to connect people to each other and to give people the chance to see um, the goodness of God in, in both creation and in, in the built environment. So that's kind of where I see myself in worship, um, kind of in those two settings. I think God feels very intangible to me sometimes, and I think my work as um, an urban planner and as a, as a parent helps me see that humans are tangible and systems are tangible, and it's very possible to, um, at least for me, to experience God in it being obvious where human flourishing is happening and where it's not happening and kind of connecting that to God's desire for us to, to flourish. Um, I, I want to come back to the to the scattered in, in just a moment, but let me ask a, maybe a, a practical question, and this is something, Drew, that you just touched on. Um, you know, we're here, come together Sunday, it's fine. What do I do when I don't quite feel like worshiping? What, how do I approach a, a gathered setting for worship when I'm just not feeling it? Yeah, I mean, that is often the case for me, to be, to be quite honest. It's... Um, kind of going back to what I said about God feeling intangible. Um, I think there is something to be said for just knowing what the next, the next good step is for you to, um, as a parent, you often don't feel like being a parent. Like you, you, you there's, <laughs> there are grand, there are grandiose, wonderful things about it. And there are things that you just don't want to, like, I hate preparing food for my kids. I just hate that task. <laughs> have always hated that task. Um, <laughs> But if, if there is an element of worship to that, if there's an element of, like, God has entrusted these, this person to my care, um, it's the right thing for me to show up for them, even if I don't feel like it. Um, whether showing up itself is an act of worship, I, I don't feel qualified to answer, but I just know I have an innate sense that that's the right thing to do, um, and that even if you don't feel like it, there is still a path towards um, towards worship and you, you know however begrudgingly you end up doing it <laughs> um it's kind of it, that that varies by day but i think there's always something kind of there if, even if you don't feel this really grand connection to god and in, in what you do mm-hmm. <laughs> um i would actually add to that i want to i would say like you have to give yourself permission to not fall into groupthink mm. just because everyone else is standing up if you don't have that right now, you don't have to. Like, just because everybody's raising their hands doesn't mean you have to. And it's that piece of, even though it's a corporate worship experience, it's also still individual at the same time. And sometimes the thing that the Lord may simply just be asking you to do is show up. And you did your part, and you are expressing that, hey, God, at least I'm here. And the Lord's saying, thank you. You love me. And so kind of not falling into that trap of just doing what everybody else is doing sometimes, we have to give ourselves permission within the corporate space for that as well. And, and I'll say, uh, what do we do when we don't feel like worshiping? We just try. Like, I think of worship as a continual outpouring to a God who is continually pouring into us so I mean the, it can be the smallest of things like waking up and being like God I thank you like that that little piece is the worship and I love what you said about the group think that the way we worship isn't determined by 
what everyone else says. You can you can determine that for yourself. Like, um, I'd like to liken worship to, you know, Christian worship being a thing and worship being a thing. Like sometimes that worship is to and other things. Sometimes for me it's to Aldi, you know. <laughs> you know? Sometimes it's to Aldi. But what what does that mean uh, from day to day, right? If 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 my worship is to Aldi, then when I'm thinking about getting groceries, I'm going to go there first. So what does that mean when I'm worshiping God? Like the small, even the smallest action, like when I step out of bed and I'm able, to, there have been times when I haven't, um, when I've faced health challenges. So the, even the smallest things I'm grateful to God about. And, and, Thanking God is an act of worship, and, and showing up the way that I do in, in the world and in life is an act of worship. So. That's good. Gratitude and showing up as worship is powerful. When, um, Drew, you touched on kind of the intersection of like, um, use the example of like parenting and, and, and worship. What, um, Speak a little bit, or, or, or all of you, speak a little bit about what does worship look like in these other aspects of one's life, whether it be work or neighboring or h- how one spends one's money or time. What, what is the, as you think about sort of those spheres of life and worship, what's the intersection look like for you? I think for me, I have... I have the privilege of having found something that I feel passionate about career-wise. I feel passionate about transportation. Um, I'm trying not to make this my like public transit is awesome soapbox <laughs> up here, <laughs> but you should ride the bus, you should bike, and you should walk places. Just kidding. Um, but I think I have I've made a connection of I think God gives us tangible ways to serve humanity and. Um, there's something, there's something that produces gratitude in me when I think about the ability to do, to put my hand to work that I feel is meaningful. Um, so I think there's, when I think about my work, I think about like my decision to go into transportation, which was this like, you know, 10 years ago, I went back to grad school and made this, what felt like a grandiose decision, like I'm gonna reorient my life so I can do this kind of work. And now that I'm there, uh, it often feels just like I'm going to, I'm, just working in Excel all day. I'm just doing spreadsheets all day. I'm answering Teams messages and emails, and it, it feels there's this like grandiose versus mundane dichotomy that's kind of hard to reconcile. Um, but I think the, the mundane is so much of life that um, I think we are meant to see some, some level of um, divinity in that and just, um, People need everyday things. Like people, people need me to finish the spreadsheet. My my kid needs me me to give them love and security and food. <laughs> um, so I think just recognizing the there are really great um, opportunities to see God at work, and there are good um, like mundane burdens that we're meant to bear. That I think um, if we are able to see it, if we are willing to see it, that God is there speaking to us in just um, the everyday like labors of, of life. For me, it's about um, honoring God and glorifying God in all aspects of life. Like um, that means my worship orients the way that I treat people. It orients the things that I choose to do. Um, yeah, it, it's it's in important, essential part of my life, um, that worship piece, yeah. So it can show up in the everyday, it can show up in the everyday like a devotional, right, in the morning, but it also can show up in the way that I speak to and greet people in my building when I'm coming in and going out, like um, seeing the humanity in folks, the way that, um, that Drew just brought up, yeah. Like if if I believe that we are all human beings made in the image of God, then I've got to be able to see the humanity in a person who's unlike me. Um, And sometimes that can be hard to do. But yeah, speaking to folks, treating people 
in a way that honors and glorifies God, living my life in a way that honors and glorifies God. And that doesn't mean we're perfect and that we're pious and that we don't do things, right? Let's be real here. Um, but it is the way that we conduct ourselves, yeah. Um, I have a very loud life. Um, what I mean by that is around sorry, me. Can, can you oh, can sorry, sorry. You speak up Let me speak up <laughs> as well. Um, what I mean by that is like a lot of different facets of my life. My family, loud. Um, home, loud. Just me and Sarah will literally fight and blast either Beyonce or Taylor Swift or whatever just to combat each other. Um, <laughs> just loudness. I we work with kids, middle schoolers. Loud. Uh, we, we walked them to Jenny's the other day. It was a loud march to throughout Capitol Hill. Um, and so my, my life has a lot of noise. And so one of the practices that I had developed kind of even before that's kind of like been anchoring me in this season is been silence in the morning. Waking up every morning after my very loud alarm clock gets me out the bed. <laughs> like going into the living room and just sitting. Typically having an app like the Calm app or something that kind of anchors me for that time, but then just like, just being in the presence. And giving the Lord my, my first fruits of the day in mm. terms of my time um, has become a new form of worship for me to enter into that silence, to enter into that meditation, um, and to start the day with him has been the has been a game changer. But then too, it empowers me now to kind of create this listening posture so that now I can continue in my worship throughout the day, throughout my very noisy day. Um, one ear to the Father and one ear to everything that's around me. So I can walk in better obedience. Like obedience is worship. And doing those very small steps that the Lord is asking you to do. Talk to this person. Smile at that person. Like, hey, clean this up off the street. Like whatever it is that the Lord is inviting you into, like those steps are forms of worship. Because you're saying like, oh, God, I hear you. I see you. And I'm doing this because I love you. So, yeah. That's uh, it's meaningful. I think the, the thread to want to pull on is that sense that you're talking about of, of seeing the humanity in everyone. Um, and I, I don't know that I've just maybe tie a couple of things that you've said, like the humanity of everyone. And, and this may sound humorous, but, but I actually mean it quite genuinely. Um, and when I step onto the metro and to recognize, wow, this is, a, this is quite a concentration of image bearers of God in this place, and that can, in response, be a, be a way that I get from point A to point B as a form of worship, of being attuned to the things that, um, that God would want me to be attuned to, and that, and that even my, my moving about as, as a form of, of worship. Um, I've, this has been a bit more of just maybe the internal sense of humor that I have, but over the past few weeks, I've dabbled it on, off and on, but whenever I run into something that is a, a bit displeasing to me, um, I will respond by going, well, praise God. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of like my own version of bless your heart, you know, which yeah. is not really a blessing if, if you're from parts of the South, which I am, but it, but it has started to turn in me and to actually go, no, even in this like hard spot, somebody cutting me off in traffic or whatever, I go, well, praise God. Yeah. I'm here. I'm still moving, still working, still going. And so that even those rough patches where I'm like, might want to say something else, it's been like this self-discipline to go, no, praise God, uh, and to turn that to worship too. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. Um, this will be maybe kind of um, end here, and realizing that we're getting a conversation started that we have no intention of ending or could arrive at any end, but more to start something for all of us. Let me ask you this. In what ways is, you know, we've talked about worship in sort of different places when we gather, but also when we scatter.
But in what ways is worship uh, an ongoing nature of our lives as Christians? And in what ways is it distinct from the everyday coming and going? I guess maybe another way that I'm trying to ask that is, um, yes, that uh, worship can pervade every aspect of our lives, but then what makes it distinct? Does that make sense? Yeah, Charles, you're shaking your head, yes? So we'll just start with you. Perfect, come on. <laughs> um, Say a proud for us, I'll, I'll try. Uh, in, in terms of like, well, one, to make it distinct, I do think there needs to be intention. Mm. You can't unintentionally worship God. Because then it's like, what are you actually unintentionally worshiping? Um, and so there needs to be some level of intention um, in the action, in the obedience step, in like whatever it is you're, you're doing, like there needs to be some level of that. Um, however, because of, what is it, the Romans tw- um, 12 of like mm-hmm. our bodies are yeah. mm-hmm. um, our sacrifices, like our worship, yeah. it's a yeah. living sacrifices, yeah. you know, it is reasonable work. She, she's the one that went to school, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Come on, Howard. Come on now. Don't let Spellman show you up. What's up? Hold up. Different panel discussion for a different day. Um, but it it is it's that piece that at the same time, like if we are also living sacrifices, like everything that we do can count as worship. However, it's that intention that and for me, that that shifts it of like, oh, no, no, no. This is not for man. This is not for this thing over here. This is not for this person over here. But this is for God. Yeah. Um, this action, this, this silence, this, this song, this moment of using my breath, it's for God. And therefore now, it's a form of worship. Um, thank you for bringing that Romans um, scripture out. Uh, that That presenting myself as a living sacrifice is the reasonable worship that's like the least we could do is to um, live our live our lives oriented by worship but as people who were created to do this like we were created to worship we were born to worship so yeah was it look What's yeah, what makes it distinct? What makes what it makes distinct? Um, I, I agree with what Charles said yeah. here, the intention behind it. Yeah. Like, um, I'm doing these things with a purpose. I was created for this thing, but then I am doing it on purpose. Like, um, it's, not, um, it's not innate. I have to uh, set that intention at the beginning of the day, yeah, yeah. to say, Today I will live as though God has given me this breath in my body and treat people as though God has given me this breath in my body. It's distinct because um, God said to do it, and God said this is what we were created for. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, um, the pervading everyday versus the distinct. I think the everyday stuff for me is kind of what I mentioned earlier, the everyday tasks of, of parenting and work where you're kind of just trying to do a good job with what God has set before you and but like the object of your attention is still kind of your task like I'm still focusing on my kid or my job even though it's like if we're saying it's technically an act of worship because you know (laughs) you're doing a good job that is distinct from I think at least for me for intentional gratitude towards God as being um, like the originator of of all the good things in my life whether that's my kid or the work that I'm able to do, or if I'm walking the dog and I just see a really beautiful sky and I just take a minute to thank God for the sky and that I have the ability to, to recognize um, beauty in the world and that we have the ability to create art ourselves, um, to, t- to take time to make, to make God the, um, the object of my attention, at least in that moment, by saying, I believe you're the originator of this this beauty and my ability to appreciate the beauty um, and the originator of like my desire for for justice in the world and for for people to have livable cities and environments and good transportation like I believe I believe that comes from God and I think the intentional part is is 
crediting God either internally or externally as being the, the, the source of that, you know, insert good thing X, Y, Z here. Um, so at least for me, that, that's how I kind of separate the, the distinct versus the, the everyday. Yeah, thank you. Friends, uh, they've given us a gift, have they not? Um, just the ways that you have shared with us, just some of the takeaways that our voice, um, we don't have to have the same voice and it ain't got to be good, but the intention uh, of where we're trying to go. Um, that there are days where there's joy that I can't summon on my own and I need other voices. Um, that worship is the breath that God has given me and those that are around me and so I can worship God in the grandiose and the mundane. So thank you for these treasures that you've given us and a reminder that God's kingdom has um, Reese's, Aldi, and are walkable, uh, apparently. Perfect. So can we give uh, thanks to them? Okay.